So we are going to talk about uh, Java on R, uh, not surprisingly, because it was in the schedule. Uh, hello, I'm Dmitry Shuiko. I work at a company named Bellsoft. I'll tell about uh, it a bit uh, later. Uh, so the topic is Java on R, but it's basically about JVM, and sometimes just about programs on ARM platform. So I worked with a company named Bellsoft. Uh, company is pretty young, but we all originated from Oracle. So we have been doing Java for years in Oracle. Now we are doing Java in Bellsoft. And our distribution is called Liberica JDK, just in case. You can easily try it, download installers, um, or Docker images, or whatever. It's pretty usable. So yeah, we are a visible part of community, at least for past two years, uh, and I, I believe previously also. Um, we are part of Oracle now as an independent company. We are among top contributors in the upstream of OpenJDK. And if you've been uh, at the opening talk, I think that many write words that are said about contribution to open source. And that's a, not Apache ecosystem, OpenJDK ecosystem, but still, uh, it all looks very similar. And there are offers, committers, and yeah, we are a part of community. So what do we know about ARM? ARM processors, ARM CPUs are everywhere. And for decades, uh, for a long time, no, there's a different architecture than x86. Uh, it's more often like more power efficient. Uh, it's a different design, uh, different instruction set, uh, risk at the very beginning, so yeah. We can easily find ARM devices when we look in our pockets and our wrists um, everywhere. At this computer, I believe there are some ARM devices, not only a single Intel main processor and also other architectures, but never mind. Of course, in our phones and in more interesting connected devices like sensors, uh, again, we are waiting for 5G, but even with current technologies, there is a lot of data flowing from automated sensors to big data systems and all other things that we discussed today. And it flows typically through some gateways. Uh, they may be like TCP enabled or they may use some other protocols. And not so rare that you can see Java in their devices. And yeah, the Berka JDK is suitable also for that kinds of things. Just few vendors uh, listed here, but of course there are numerous of them. And uh, if you talk about some bigger machines, process processing in cloud or like backend, anyway, it all there are uh, there were tries to implement server with ARM cores uh, years ago. The company called Calxeda. It wasn't very stable, but there's, it was a good try. And I know some people who continued the experiments more successfully in, well, later. But just to let you know that uh, it all started long ago. ARM cores, uh, there is a variety of them. And there are some hardware specs, uh, but what we are going to talk about is like ARM A, because we want to write applications. Right? We want processing of uh, sensor data in some sensible way. Uh, we want uh, server, logic, everything. So yeah, mostly if we talk about like hotspot JVM, it's not a real time thing. We just write applications, right? And uh, there is a like there are two um, major interest versions nowadays of the spec, uh, ARM seven and ARM eight, and uh, for both cases we are interested yeah in application part, uh, but uh, what we can see in some device, yeah. For ARM processors, it's typical for, for years, I think, to combine different kinds of cores. 
Intel started to experiment uh, with it. Uh, there's a new machine, I don't remember the name, but it also combines different types of core in a single socket, in a single package. And uh, yeah, it's quite typical for ARM, for many, for example, mobile phones. You have low power cores combined with super power cores uh, to save your energy, your battery, or to give you the best performance. And of course, uh, we may consider ourselves as advocates and enthusiasts, and of course, uh, many of us use devices like Raspberry Pi. And by the way, they were the first company that released Java 9 for Raspberry, uh, OpenJDK. And uh, yeah, a lot of this stuff. I really like building, well, not cars, but sensor, uh, uh, some solutions to sensors and things like that. So what's inside? If you take uh, Raspberry and, and we download, for example, Liberica, we will work with OpenJDK. And in OpenJDK in Hotspot Virtual Machine, there are CPU-specific parts in source and, of course, in binary uh, that are related to some uh, instruction uh, sets and ARM is not an exclusion. So for example, for Raspberry, you'll work with ARM32 port, which is now open sourced. Uh, so you can contribute to that port. You can easily you know, understand uh, some failures. And it also contains all the features of Java 9 and above. If you get the latest version, which is currently 12, yeah. And soon it will be 13, and the latest stable version is 11. So everything is like x86, but for small devices, which is very good. So yeah, you can uh, create smaller runtimes. So used uh, uh, also used uh, special builds of a virtual machine, like minimal VM, which is really small. So many people say, oh yeah, we like Go. It's only 20 megabytes. All right, for Hello World. And if you install packages, you get more. And yeah, Hello World packaging for Java will be around 20 megabytes also. So what's the difference? And you get, well, different garbage collectors. And many of those are probably not worse than Go garbage collector. Yeah, and interesting features uh, like uh, JavaFX support, so you can build GUIs still uh, in a very nice way, even for very uh, you know, weak devices, because you can work directly with the frame buffer, and it is super efficient. No like, widget system, just draw to buffer. All right, as I said, minimal VM is minimal. It's uh, very small, uh, much smaller than server VM, for example. But it still contains important features, like security manager. You still get nice managed runtime. Not some rapid thing that just, you know, I write line of code and executes. Hooray, let's migrate to, I don't know, Python. OK. You understand it. <coughs> so if you talk about, uh, ARM64, it developed uh, step by step for years. Uh, this year is not on the slide because the slide is you know, too short. So step by step, uh, there are some optional and non-optional parts, like uh, Neon, for example, a uh, unit for vector and floating point operations of bigger lens. Uh, some optional extensions, some of them, I would say, really important for typical Java applications. Uh, but they are not implemented in some CPUs. Uh, sometimes it's a surprise, like for example, in, maybe it's not high-end, but mid-end or low-end Huawei servers, uh, don't have Atomix extension, and that sometimes uh, feels scary. What's interesting is that Intel for years has uh, extension for uh, vector operations, uh, AVX. And ARM responded with uh, SVE extension, 
which is a scalable vector extension, uh, which operates the vectors of uh, not known length, but fixed for certain hardware. So you get assembly code that will work differently on different hardware and describes some abstract vector operations via data. It's very interesting. And what's not on the slide, uh, this year, uh, two other extensions were presented. One is SV2 uh, to work with uh, floating point, and another is transactional memory, which is super cool. Yeah, and more and more useful extensions like crypto. Who uses crypto, right? We don't know the SSL. No, everything's open. And uh, as I mentioned, the set of extensions and the what version of spec is implemented, it depends on the concrete CPU and hardware vendor. There are multiple uh, vendors, um, not well known listed here at this slide, but still. And Kevin and Marvel are now one company, Marvel. And you see others, you know them, of course. What's interesting here is that ARM presented uh, their own view of platform evolution, starting like from today, uh, for big deployments, for cloud market. So they plan to increase their market share and uh, to get more performant hardware every year. Like currently, it's a platform uh, called Cosmos. And if you know the name Graviton, anyone heard? OK. There is a well, well-known company called Amazon that has this piece of hardware, uh, the custom design, based on ARM's uh, reference design. And the uh, first step, which should appear this year, uh, to Iris platform, which is also called N1 Neoverse. Uh, early reports say that uh, the performance difference is even like not 30, but 60% in some arithmetic benchmarks. Yeah, you know, it depends on the benchmark. Some other uh, vendors, interesting, like Ampere, uh, former APM. You can get those servers as a commodity hardware, as a drop-in replacement for your Intel machine. So you just plug out and plug in, and it should work, basically. Uh, was tested in clouds. Uh, I will mention them uh, later. What's interesting, it's quite a typical machine for basically for everything, right? You see it's like 32 core, like enough memory, and it's fast enough. It's a good machine, really. And what do you get? Lower price, uh, better power consumption. What do you expect from ARM? You get there. What's else interesting? Canon Tundra X2. It is way more powerful. You can get up to 256 cores per server, and up to 4 terabytes of memory, and infinite band. And well, and performance is really interesting. We'll discuss it a bit later. I would say it's very good for many tasks like Java enterprise applications, or maybe what was mentioned today, like probably machine learning or something done on CPU. Then uh, sometimes CPU works better than GPU or at least the same. And you can like, get a, put a model per core. And if you get that many cores, it works very well. And this is not something you know we just talk about. This is something you can touch, really literally by your fingers. And that's last year on Lenaro Connect. So, and then you touch it by SSH. You see a picture like this. This is H top, right? Uh, so if you look precisely, you will see that. Uh, there are only 224 uh, cores, right? Uh, there are others. Well, because the slide is too short again. <laughs> so, yeah. It's fun. It's, it, it's a big beast, yeah. 
And uh, what's good here is that ecosystem is very mature now. For about like 10 years, there were a lot of problems solved by now. So when you get Intel machine, you expect that everything will work. You can just install your operating system, plug the machine, install your packages. Well, not a problem. Then I was a student. Uh, we had a task. Who can install Linux right now in front of me? Is that my tutor then? Gets good mark. <laughs> so it, it wasn't so for x86 also, but now it's so simple. And it's now as simple as for x86 on ARM. It's, it just works. And if you're interested in special piece of software, you can go to this side, watch on ARM, and check. Is it supported? Is there some information about this software, particular software, on this platform? And you see, of course, yeah, OpenDDK. Uh, what's missing here in buzzwords? Yeah, this picture, right? Uh, like maybe last month uh, or so, ARM at Docker announced partnership, uh, which in practice means that you can cross-build Docker images on your laptop, for example, or, or on any other x86 machine. What's funny, uh, that's a technology not related just to ARM. For example, uh, some people started to uh, make experiments with RISC-5 in a very same way. That's awesome. You even don't need real instance or cloud or emulator, nothing. You just work with Docker and you install it and you can even run it. So in OpenJDK, the another valuable piece of technology, there are uh, two ARM ports. For one port suits for two version of architecture. Uh, but now uh, it has been deprecated and removed from OpenJDK uh, for a 64-bit part. I mean the first one. So for ARM32, that is one port. And there is another port, AR64. Uh, initially developed by Red Hat. And it's also available in mainline as open source, and we contribute to both of them, and probably for the first one, we are main maintainer. Whatever. Oh, this is, this is wrong. ZGC is coming. ZGC came. Like, last week, uh, ZGC uh, implementation for ARM has been contributed to OpenJDK. And uh, uh, that was done by... Uh, Linaro, and Bellsoft helped with these features and lower part. So, we have ARM ports, we have hardware. Will it be efficient? Will it perform good? Of course, no, uh, because, uh, well, then you do basic support, you care about correctness, and we spent some time also solving correctness issues. But then it gets to performance. And we know that for static compilers and for many environments, we just use specific technology called intrinsic. Then we write code, most probably in assembly language, very suitable for certain tasks, for a certain platform, and put it as a replacement for some function, available in runtime or whatever like it's done in GCC or uh, VM, C compilers. And in Hotspot, uh, there are different kinds of intrinsics. So we can uh, manipulate intermediate representation of uh, byte code that then goes to JIT compiler. Or we can also write and use some native code in different ways, like stops. So we can just make calls. So consider an example. We do some piece of math, a very useful one. Then we just uh, multiply two long numbers and use a part of the production. And this code has a special, uh, oh, this, this one doesn't. Anyway, so if we will uh, 
compile this code, this C2 JIT compiler, it will be, if it will be hard. And we'll get some interesting results. I will show it uh, first of all. Yeah. Like we'll get some assembly code, right? With some, some machine code, uh, only 14 instructions, all this small latency. Not bad. It's really good. Uh, much, much faster than interpreter, you know. Yeah. What are other options? We could write native code and make a JNI call. That would be, I think, much more expensive than 14 clocks. Uh, we can try to manipulate IR, but that's really complex and not sure what it will give us. Another thing is we know that this task is performed by a single instruction in the instruction set. So we have to use it, right? It's a single instruction with latency 4, like 14 and 4, right? Like 3.5x difference. So sometimes it's not easy to add an intrinsic to hotspot, but you know, it's good to be a part of community. You always get help, and then you got experience previously. It's not that hard. But uh, in port that is quite modern, you have to do more steps typically. Like you go and fix or add instructions to macro assembly. You create some scaffolding code, many things. Like in this case, we had to add the instruction uh, to make it visible for C2 to make special C2 node for that instruction, and all the things. And of course, you have to verify the result, because you've done a lot of things, uh, not just instruction, but something else happens. Will it work? What will be the performance? Hopefully, it's Java, well, or JVM. So we have nice tools, like micro-benchmarking tools, like JMH, where you can measure performance of this assembly code using Java code. Right? So we rely on C2 optimizations. We can check that C2 did it work. We can check the assembly separately, all the things. But we can easily create a micro benchmark that will do multiply highs a lot and to measure performance. And it's, as predicted, 3.5x better. Woo! I'm not sure if it sounds inspiring. Because, yeah, we see speed up for multiply high. Hmm, okay. <laughs> so, but what will give us to enterprise? So what typical enterprise application does in our world? It's a, some, I don't know, service in internet responding to TCP connections, the HTML or JSON or um, And typical object there is array or string or JSON object, right? But probably string is a very basic thing. You enter the strings, you pass information using strings. And strings are different. I'm from country where, you know, strings are like the lower one. It's Cyrillic string, and every character there well, takes two bytes to represent it. And in Latin one encoding, we just need one byte. So mostly, why do we spend extra bytes? Yeah, and since Java 9, compact strings were implemented. It's a nice cool feature of Hotspot that distinguishes strings if they are one byte encoding or, well, two bytes. And it saves a lot of memory. with no performance loss, and even without performance gain in certain scenarios. It's very good. There is a generic implementation. But it heavily re relies on intrinsics, which means it works correctly on ARM, right? If you take just Java 9, with no additions. But what will be the performance? Probably not so good. And how do we optimize such scenarios? First of all, you need to know your data. Everyone talks here about their data. Visualize data, see what your data is, what does it mean? So for strings, it's very simple. Uh, well, at least then you get a lot of hip dumps. 
and analyze some statistics. Strings typically in Java world are very short. So eight bytes is a magical length. And very long strings are very rare. So you see the distribution, it's really self-describing. But the code that creates a string, so then we work the strings, we first have to create a string, right? It consists of multiple parts, including very interesting part that actually checks if it's a latent string or not. So it's called has negatives, and it has special annotation that says that there may be an intrinsic for doing this. So is that complex? Well, looks like not complex thing. We just go through the string and look if there are some suspicious bytes. But what we have to do here is a common pattern. We load everything that's there. And in ARM, there are different load instructions. You can load a single byte and blah, 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 blah. You can load a pair of white 64-bit registers. Uh, there are also loads in uh, Neon unit. But then you operate with Neon unit. Basically, you have no improvement in general. So you have same uh, latency of loads because it's implemented the same. But you have a big penalty moving data from general purpose register to Neon or back. It's like six, which is very, very much. So uh, what instruction would you use to walk through the array of bytes? to get as less instructions as possible. Yeah, yeah, probably payloads, right? But there is a small problem marked with red. <laughs> you can get sackful because, well, you load something that doesn't belong to you. And of course, you can be smarter and make loads shorter, then you get to the end of the array. But that's not the most efficient way. You can intersect a lot and then ignore a part of loaded data with some, again, special knowledge about ARM ISA. So that, that's how uh, basic implementation for this intrinsic tricks um, everyone to get better performance and not to fault, uh, and not to get a sec fault. What's more interesting? Then we do loads and intersect or something. Some loads may be unaligned, or if we start with unaligned address. And surprisingly, in our well high-level software world, it's not a problem to load something from any address. That's a constant time operation. What? Well, constant may have constant, you know. <laughs> and uh, this varies greatly. And we really saw it in micro benchmarks. Uh, the numbers are real. That depends on vendor. Sometimes don't have penalty at all, but some have very, very you know, bad penalty for unaligned loads. So if you can do aligned loads, you better do that. And that's additional part of logic, right? If you align your data, you choose uh, what load instructions to use, you test uh, intersections, so it's complex. Uh, and it's as complex as 200 instructions. And you know the cache line size and instructions uh, in ARM architecture are like four bytes? Oh, yeah, 64. So it, it, it's out of you know, cache line Then you work with such a function. And when it's hot, this is really not good. So for Big methods. We have an interesting option to do a call uh, if we really need that all that complex logic. And for shorter strings, for shorter arrays, we can just implement a very small piece of code doing uh, exactly this, which is very similar to its uh, Java analog. Uh, so. That's place where we make a call is called a stop. We can statically, well, 
write it in microassembly and compile it along with all the virtual machine. So it's a special place which is called not as a JNI thing, but as a part of virtual machine. So generated code, and then the do call and everything works. So uh, let's look again. We have different loads, we have comparisons, and they give us speed up. Each part gives some speed up. And we can go further. Because in some hardware, there are no hardware prefetchers. If you look, for example, at this machine, CPU here has two hardware prefetchers. Um, not surprisingly. But in ARM world, even in server ARMs, that's not sometimes true. But there is a nice instruction for software prefetching, which also presents in x86 instruction set. And you can actually get benefit of it sometimes, because you may be smarter than hardware prefetcher. And it allows to uh, minimize cache misses, because your data is already here, near your CPU. But you have to carefully select when to start prefetch and what will be prefetching distance. So it's, um, you need an experiment for that, a lot of experiments. But after all that experiments, you can improve your speed up even more. So up to 5x, which is really good because in compiler world, then you get percent or two or three reliably. That's super good. And we got speed ups for all lengths of strings. Depending on length, speed up is different. And you have to do all that measurements because there may be some important or some weird string length that you get tremendous regression. That won't work because community will blame you for that. Of course. And that are not all optimizations we made. So we still continue doing this. And in Java 11, we delivered a Java enhancement proposal implementation for uh, AR64 intrinsic improvement, uh, which is really fun because it's also a part of you know process in the community. Then you do something big. So in OpenJDK, uh, there are like, projects, jabs, and also some enhancements, well, points. So this is a mid-size, but still big for us feature. So I made improvements in different areas, like string and array operations, including checksums and strings for com compact strings, and math operations, which is a separate fun because then you work, for example, with floating point mathematics. You have interesting limitations of both Java specification and what CPU can give you, depending on the instruction. And also different algorithms, because some of algorithms implemented as a generic solution work worse than some custom ones, some smarter ones for different CPUs. Well, it's real fun. So what? What did it give us not in micro benchmarks, but in big benchmarks? Then we compare ARM and x86. We did it. We looked at some nice Xeon gold, very expensive in the cloud, but yeah, bare metal one. We have some well known enterprise benchmark for Java. And it turned out that both for latency and for throughput, Thunder X2 machine turned to be better. At the same time, it is two times cheaper. So <laughs> you really should think of it. You get better performance for less money. There's the trick. No trick. <laughs> it's the best performance for less money. That's it. Uh, yeah, it, it was run on a single, uh, a single processor uh, with some you know, more or less similar flags for x86 and ARM. Uh, minimal tunings just to let heap be reasonably big and, well, no, 
no unusual options. It's just typical Java command line. <laughs> so, other benchmark, well-known JVM benchmark, kind of micro benchmark, but still somewhere in the middle between separate micro benchmarks and big benchmark. Again, almost everywhere you can get our machine that is better than very powerful Intel one, and sometimes it's not better because of vectorization. But that's upcoming. Just check it in a year or year and a half, and probably things will change. And those machines, as I, can, as I said, are available. You can touch them, or you can get them in a cloud. So you can get them, um, for example, Packet Cloud provides both Ampere and Kaveon, but it's not uh, that big base, but uh, first generation that's slightly you know, less powerful. And uh, Scaleway also provides them. It's, it's VPS, it's bare metal. And there's one more provider. I mentioned Graviton, so Graviton is at Amazon. You can get ARM instance at Amazon, and this CPU is really powerful. You can get, I don't remember, up to probably 16 or 32 cores, and they're really good. Really, really good. So, uh, please. Check the job that was done by, by a lot of people. Big community, Lunaro, OpenJDK. You can get everything up and working on ARM. You can get your fingers into cloud and try ARM right now. You can install Java by using, for example, Liberica Docker images. It's very easy. Your favorite operating system. Major vendors support, Linux vendors support ARM. You can also get Windows, well, if you would like to. I'm not sure. Everything was expected. Check it. Check latest Java, because it's optimized, and it's been optimized from this release to current release also. And you can easily try it if, as a Liberica distribution. Yeah, thank you. We have some time, some time for questions. Yeah, we have a couple of minutes. Yeah. Um, definitely. When you tuned the JVM flags for ARM versus Intel, why did you have to change bias locking? Uh, well, it actually doesn't change a lot. Because uh, the command line we took was from uh, one of articles uh, we met. So we decided to reproduce that results and then to see uh, what results will be for ARM. So uh, in our case, it was like it gets slightly um, more stable results. Yeah, but actually, I think no change in score. So there's no known mechanism because because for this benchmark, uh, it plays role like in the beginning. So just yeah. I don't know if this is really directly, but, but it was about vectorized instructions. So you you, you know you mentioned the hardware has support for them. Uh, I, I guess there will be some optimizations that make use of them in some cases, but is there any, um, I don't know, move to expose them like in the, in Java so that you can actually? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's good. called Vector API, and uh, it's being implemented right now for SVE. So it it's very likely that support for ARM and Intel uh, will come together at the same time. Then, Yeah, and there's implementation for Neon, but you have no profit of using Neon because you have the same performance as auto vectorization. Well, at least then auto vectorization works. Anybody else? Perfect. Thank you very much. It was amazing. Thank you.